it has been five whole days since I sat down to review Death in the Family by Carl Uwe Knauskar. And I'll be honest, I was deflated. I was in a bit of a... <sighs> I had regrets about this whole project of mine. It didn't scratch any itch that I had or it didn't give me an itch that I didn't know that I needed. So I went in pretty hesitantly into the second book, A Man in Love. If you want to know what it's like to be a parent, if you want to know what it's like to become a parent, because no one really teaches you that the, the kid arrives and you're you're set out on your way out to the hospital and you go, what am I doing? I think most people who have become parents understand what that feeling is. But also when you become a parent, how people who don't have kids or people who are close to you treat you differently now that you have kids. I mean, a man in love ticks a lot of these boxes. Though Knausgaard is in Sweden as a single man, legally, on paper, he's still married and he has to deal with getting into relationships knowing that he's still married, knowing that he is on paper in love with someone but has wanted to be in love, he's wanted to find love, he's wanted to invigorate love with Linda. Unlike the first novel where we're talking about fatherhood and death, we're talking here about love and to become a father. That's really what this is all geared up to tell. I have to say upon reflection, the first book, The Death in the Family, Knausgaard's truthfulness comes across with angst, with defiance built into it. And I feel as though that has to play a part in that he's talking about his adolescence, him growing up. And I suppose there's some inherent vice to that. How this differs to book two of my struggle is that Knausgaard is an adult. And when he talks about things, I didn't feel angst. It feels shameful. This brute force style of prose that has epitomised Knausgaard's work has time to reflect, it has moments of regret within it. Such as when Linda first rejects him and tells Knausgaard that she doesn't really want to go on a date with him, she quite likes his friend. He gets drunk, um, gets a shard of glass and starts cutting his face. And when he wakes up in the morning, he has to walk through the streets, has to get on public transport, and he knows that there are people talking about him and looking at him. But I feel as though in the first book it would have been a, yeah, I did it, what are you going to do? Like, there's like a confessional feel, as if it's cathartic, that it's cathartic in like the worst way possible. The Canals God is just able to tell you He's there going, like, worst decision I've ever made. Any damage inflicted on your face is, is there for the world to see. It doesn't matter if you can or cannot rationalise it, if there's a why or why not. It, it's just, like, blatant to the world. Like, I cut myself multiple times. People used to, like, look at my arms and used to be comments and... Oh, like, you can't describe the... Like the instant regret that kind of like sits in your stomach when someone notices or when they they pry into a question that even when you don't show, they know that they're there. That is absolutely horrific. And there's a lot of Knauskard's depreciation of self in this as he becomes an adult, as he becomes a parent, that... He can't look after himself in the same way that he has when he was single. He can't just get up and do something. He has to, like, focus everything around the kids. I'm not saying that neither is Knausgaard that the kids are to blame and they should pay a price for that. You just make sacrifices when you become a parent. You have to cut off certain things. If that means going to the gym, if that means eating better food, if that means even going to the shops. You have to cut your corners. This self-depreciation, I completely understand. When people say that Knausgaard like, feels as though he's like lifted off the text, like, I get it with this. Um, I, I used to be skinny. 
back in the day. I used to be used to be number one uh, skinniest housemate. That's what I used to say. You know what? Um, <laughs> I I I used to have a lot of videos uh, before I started doing book reviews, and I was a lot skinnier. Like this is like back when I was in university. So this is like ten years ago. So if my boss is watching this, just tell me to go to the job center. <laughs> Who wants the party? Caffeine, as we all know, is God's gift to us to say you don't need sleep. Where did I go wrong in the world? When I started posting, obviously people would go back and see the difference. And I, I used to get like a few comments of, oh my god, like, you, ooh, like your weight's a little bit different now, or um, like, oh god, you don't even look like the same person. And I have constantly struggled. Like I absolutely like hate the way I am, like, most days. In regards to, like, what I used to look like, I, 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 I liked that. I, I felt, like, comfortable. Like, now, it's horrendous. Like, I, I hate it. I don't feel, like, comfortable. Like, there's been videos I've recorded, and even though I'm, like, sat in, like, the same position here like even just like the way that like i visualize myself and i'm like no cut it there's been loads of times like that and i'm not here looking for any sympathy because trust me you could say like the loveliest thing about how i look and i know i'm like this 16 stone fat boy who hates everything at this current moment you know like like um Oh, it's really interesting. So when I started putting on weight, and this is this isn't to do with like me having kids, because this is when I left university and I got like an office job, and I would just sit down and I stopped doing like all my drama and theatrics. So I kind of like I just moved to like this more sedentary lifestyle. Fuck it, let's go there. Right. So I I got like I got all these stretch marks here that probably don't even seem like that bad to people, but I I hated them like with an absolute passion, but. It was more logical to me to like cut them so I so as if they looked like scars because I could deal with that more to the fact that I was putting on weight like that to me was like like I need to do something I knew what I needed to do I need to like go back to the gym go back to my hobbies but I moved into this corporate life of working from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. in regards to like commuting and going back and forth like there was just no time and I was sat at the desk and I was working away for commission and that like et into my soul and absolutely like made like the shell of a human like I like, absolutely am. I love the people, I like the environment, I like the money but I was miserable. I remember going to the doctors the first time because my cut it had gone from nothing to yes um, and I just remember the doctor being like quit your job and just be being like like how like how can i quit my job i was saying to her i was like so like how do i pay for rent how do i how do i do this i just turned around and just went that's all up to me to decide and i was like oh and then i did change jobs and obviously my money crashed and it was like the worst thing. Like I felt so low. I just felt so low. Because obviously my parents have like nothing. I didn't grow up like the best circumstances. Everything was like skint. Everything was like scrounging. I got this job where I was able to. Basically I became like a Patrick Bateman. Um, from American Psycho. So like my, my worth came from like my wealth. Like from, from that point of view. Um, I've just, like, not been able to, like, forward, like, a train ticket to work, so I take that much of a cut. Like, it was, it was horrendous, and obviously, with that, my weight went, <coughs> and I've been miserable ever since. Let's get back to the book. You didn't know how awkward, how horrendous, how just, like, cringeworthy kids parties are until Klaus Guard like reminds you how horrendous like like the, no one wants to be there over like a certain age no one wants to be there and you're there for your kid and his kids aren't even like enjoying this party at all and there's this other kid oh this other kid 
who takes Colonel Scott's keys and is kind of like, ha ha ha, like you can't have them, like come and get it. And he, he talks about like he's trying to play it cool of like, oh, yeah, you got my keys, but there's like fire inside that is like, give me my damn keys and like, just leave me alone. And I appreciate that. And he talks about like, like is it bad to like hate this kid that he doesn't know? And I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be honest here. Yes, because there was this kid who used to live in our street. I hated him with a passion. Like every time I would see his face, I'd be like, "Get away from me!" He used to be like so vile towards Dora, my eldest. It was like a joke. He'd just come up to her and be like, "Go and die!" And he'd like kick her and push her. So like there came a moment where, like in the neighborhood. Anytime he'd come out, I'd have to, like, remove Dora because he was just, he was just horrendous. And the parents would be sat there going, ha ha, like, oh, boys will be boys. Like, oh, this is what kids do, isn't it? I remember looking at his dad in the face and being like, sort out your fucking kid. He bullies a girl who's three years younger than him. Like, tell him, get out. Actually, we were already out, so it's more like, well, get in. Luckily, they moved house. Knausgaard, as he's the writer, is like the stay-at-home dad while Linda's out. So he takes his kids to, like, baby club groups where, like, loads of mums predominantly go um, and, like, spend an hour just doing, like, sensory, doing some, like, songs, nursery rhymes, just kind of, like, get them, like, socially interacted. And I understand what it's like being a dad taking the kid to one of those groups and feeling like like I'm here for my kid and you want me to be you want me to do the hokey cokey every week like ah uh, okay I don't mind doing it and you just got me like really awkwardly like all these like mums like doing it or like giggling like they all go for coffee afterwards they're like really hip and cool and it's me going you're, you're right uh, in you're right uh, in in out, in out, you shake it all about. Which is really fun the first time, but after like I paid six weeks for it, like the last time it's more just me like this. Do the hokey cokey. So, so I just do that now for the turnaround. Like I'm not even here for it. All of them's like, hee hee hee, oh Jessica, oh, did you watch that new BBC documentary? And there's me on the other side being like, I've watched it, but no one's asking me. Sometimes if you're lucky, another dad will turn up and you do have this moment where you clock each other and you go, and you just do this a lot. And you just go, yeah, like, yeah, I'm here. I'm a hip cool dad. Whoa, the hokey cokey. Whoa, the hokey cokey. I actually got told off in gymnastics for going on the trampoline. I was like, me, I paid like 50 quid to go for six weeks. I'm going on your trampoline and I'm having a whale of a time. Maybe that's why the mums don't speak to me, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just resonated with these parts. I didn't really resonate as much as when he first kisses Linda. He faints and everyone thinks that he's done drugs. I didn't relate to that. But just him talking about being a parent or like where he, he shouts at his kid and he already, he's like, why am I shouting at a one-year-old? Because she doesn't know what she's doing. So like, why am I losing my rag over like this really tiny thing? Oh wait, it's because I'm like sleep deprived. I don't really know like how to deal with this child and what it's like to deal with a child in public when you're like, like, oh, it's okay. Like, like, let's, let's keep, let's keep walking and smile like, oh, what my kids are like. There's only so much time you can play that part until like your child will just go wow and you go oh my god like stop it. And that's just what it's like to be a parent because it's not always that precise moment. It's not that little thing. It's just the fact that like you're knackered, you're tired, you're exhausted, you, you're trying to do other things, you're trying to juggle your relationship, you're trying to juggle your social life, you're trying to juggle like your work and like like everything with that, you wouldn't change it for the world. Like it's like having kids like the best thing ever. But sometimes you do just have to give yourself like a little bit of slack. And where Clowns God doesn't give slack, which was really interesting, is him as a writer and writers in general. Within this modern times, it feels as though what Clowns God is saying with his other authorly friends is that they need like a lot of reassurance like of what they're writing, what they're putting their 
effort into their production of work. Like, it has to be, like, constantly, like, no, like, you're really good. And even Klaus got, like, he won a really prestigious award for his first book, his debut. And he still needs, like, constant reassurance of Klaus got, like, you're really good. Like, his friend says to him, like, how can you describe going to the toilet? And everyone's like, best description of going to the toilet ever. And on that point, Kamskod writes two pages just on changing a baby nappy and the kids just wriggling. And I felt that, especially when he says that his kid's wriggling and the foot touches the poo. And I just went, it's happened to me. It's happened to me. I was like, you need the contingency plan there. And he talked about going to the shower um, and trying to wipe it all off and making sure like none of it goes everywhere. It's just me going, I've done that a few times. Like I would do that. I, I asked my wife to read it and she was there just reading it like stone face. And I could tell when she got to the, the foot touches the poo and she went. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, Klaus Klaus does just describe very everyday moments. They're very normal. But I, I think because I can resonate with this more than my father dying because my father's alive, meticulous. He does go into like a lot of depth and if you don't resonate with what he says at times you are a bit like okay like how long we got here especially like the christening um of his daughter i was a bit like okay like when are we getting on to the next pages i'd like to be able to tangent off and tell you a story probably a prominent one when people talk about love which is the moment me and my wife got engaged now for most people it is quite simply that you choose a ring and you propose and you become engaged not me i don't like making things easy for myself so i i went the long way around this diamond rings are expensive i don't think anyone's going to argue or doubt me on that alex and i were walking past a jewelers one day in cardiff city center and Alex stopped and was looking at one of the displays at the window. And something caught my eye. And it was something that screamed to me that now was the right time. Like, if I don't, if I'm not going to propose now, I'm never going to do it. And I walked closer. And it was, it was everything that I had wanted to see in this window. I want you to picture this. So in the pedestal, in the centre... There was this sapphire Diana cut ring. Surrounding it, moving down, were variations of it. But right at the bottom of this pedestal, to the left, like the utmost left, like it was just in the corner of the window. I'll never forget it. Job vacancy. And I thought, we're doing it. I was currently working night like, shifts at a call centre and was working four condensed days. So I had like a good amount of time off. The days I had off would predominantly be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So I knew in regards to like a job interview, that's like the most likely it's going to be. And I've always had the gift for gab. I left my job in recruitment for the call centre that we were recruiting for. And the only reason why I made that step was that the call centre allowed the freedom for me to do my masters. So I went in there and then spoke to the manager and was like, look, I see that you have this vacancy. I've previously been in sales. This is the reason why I've moved, but I'm looking to come back now that my studies were ending. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. Let me send you my CV. I'm free XYZ. Here's my telephone number. Wrote it down. Passed it to her. Walked out and I went, I know they're going to call me. Now this particular jewelers has a quick turnaround. I have seen that sign multiple times. It doesn't take much of a genius to realise if you have a quick turnover of staff, it's currently in summer, which is like peak wedding time, and most times people are going off a holiday and proposing that you need someone. And someone who has previous sales experience and has wanted to get back in sales, I knew I was going to get a phone call. And three days later, I get the phone call, a suit of boot, I go down there, nevertheless I get the interview, and they put this ring in front of me and go, sell me the ring. And in my head, all I'm thinking of is, that's going to be the ring that I'm going to propose to Alex with. So I sit there, I talk about the cut, blah, 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 and they were like, great, give her a day, 
Well, I was like, it's going to be less than a day. Three hours later, I get the phone call saying, are you able to start? And I go, yes, but I have two questions. The first one was, is there a dress code? And the second one was, can you just go through the staff benefits again? Oh, it's 70% off your engagement rate and you only get that once. Brilliant. Hey, I'm actually going away this weekend. Is it is it possible if I could get the engagement ring now? Because I've actually seen one in your store. Oh, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, province. I hope you've missed me. I got the certificate here. I got all the relevant documentation of a ring. And I got the ring. Um, actually, when I proposed, it was quite interesting. Um, so I, I did mention that it was like the heat of summer and Alex and I were commuted back and forth Cardiff and the valley trains are like really hot and sticky even like on like the mildest of days so stick it on like 5 p.m like peak commuter time we were both like drenched in sweat like we all, we all got like our work gear on we're like oh my god this is horrendous we get home we kind of like go upstairs i'm drenched in sweat take off my clothes i'm just in my pants now i like trying to cool down in the, in the heat wave that it was during that time and i get the ring out and i go alex i i did it i i i went to a job interview just to get discount and she went i thought that was the case I unplugged it when I plugged the lamp in. But hey! Ooh! We'll go for that one. It's been two hours because my kids woke up and I can't remember exactly what we were talking about. Possibly about being a parent and having kids. But let's move away from it. Let's talk about the other person in this story, Linda. When Knausgaard first meets Linda, she's strong. She's independent. She knows exactly what she wants and want to get it again she told Knausgaard I'm not interested in you I want to be with your friend so she clearly isn't afraid of speaking her feelings but as Knausgaard and Linda become closer as they actually get in and develop their relationship and move in Knausgaard tells us in a lot of detail about Linda's mental state and she advises him that she wanted to kill herself at one point, but she doesn't want to anymore. And when she says that, she she looks at Knausgaard and goes, you don't, you don't believe me, do you? And he tells us that he doesn't, he doesn't believe her, that it's not going to happen again, and that it's not likely, but it's something that's going to be in his mind now that she has become honest with him. Now, obviously, there's the moral stance, there's the ethical stance of does Knausgaard have the right to broadcast to the world Linda's thoughts, feelings, mental states? I believe this is going to be discussed further and in more depth later on in the series, but it feels as though by doing this, Knausgaard, he doesn't explicitly state, but you can read into it, is that he appreciates Linda's ability to be transparent, to say exactly how she feels at that moment. And I suppose, like, the precursor to this series is Linda does a documentary. Balove sits down to listen to it and says it doesn't really have a plot. It isn't exactly what he thought, but it's very honest it's it's just it's a bit of nothing the documentary is compelling and he's unsure why he likes it because it doesn't really talk about anything specifically but he likes that style he likes what linda has done so clearly linda has influenced Knausgaard in how he has approached his writing how he has approached his art how he's approached his style and i feel as though that scene was put in to show that, to show that I'm not the genius behind this. It's Linda. It's everything that Linda has done has made me the writer that I am. Going back to how Kamsgaard needs like validation. He knows it works. He knows it works. He, it's, it's already been 
field tested to some degree, so why question it? The documentary and the novels are two very different mediums, but I suppose my struggle is a kind of documentary. We keep going back to this, that it's a novelised memoir. What exactly does that mean? I, su I suppose it's more documentary-esque. Honestly, I've not really worked this out in my own head. I, I, there's the obvious answer, that it's a novelised memoir. I feel as though there's something different here. I don't think he's reinvented the wheel. I don't think he's created something completely fresh, but he's definitely added oil to the axle. Tangent enough that what could be seen as abrasive and corrosive is their relationship. There are a lot of highs, there are a lot of lows, there's a lot of miscommunication, there's a lot of just no communication between them. And trying to juggle Knausgaard's life, his writing, his deadlines, and also the fact that Knausgaard, once Vanya, their eldest, was born, he decides that he needs like an hour to himself. Like, like at some point he needs to just leave the kids, he needs to go and do his thing on his own time. Alinda has a resentment for that because she doesn't stop being a mother for an hour, so why should he? And Knausgaard's like, but if she wants it, she can have it. I just specifically asked for that, and you were happy with it. There's a clear marketer now that he's become a parent, he has to almost leave his past life. Like, everything that he has done is now filtered through people's eyes of, yeah, but now you're a responsible person, now you're an adult, you have kids, you have a responsibility. And Kanausko's kind of like, no, I'm the same person, I just have kids. Working out what fatherhood means is done in the present. It's at this moment in time, now that this kid has arrived, now that I have to take it home and we're going to look after this kid, I'm a father now, what am I going to do? What seemed counterintuitive to me is that the first book ends with Carl looking on his father's face now that he's dead. There's not really a mention. There's not really a continuation at all. Like, you could read this as a complete standalone. His dad doesn't really come up in this story, apart from at the end where Carl's mum, who's pretty absent from this. She's, Carl Uwe definitely gives the impression that his mum didn't raise him. It was his father who was there. And Carl's now the stay-at-home dad. He feels as though there's some connection, but that connection isn't made within this book. It's very much, I'm a father. This is what I'm going to do. He doesn't need to look back. But when his mum enters, she does go back. It talks about how life was an adventure with his father. And she starts crying and says, I loved him. And he says, it's like the the rare time that he's like heard that she loved him. And it kind of just leaves it on that tone. So I'm unsure if the next novel, Boyhood Island, if it's going to continue from this, where we're going to go. I would highly recommend this book. It, it definitely is a 180 compared to Death in the Family, but A Man in Love, I would give an eight out of 10. Look at that. We got high hopes. We got high hopes moving forward.